Board Herds, uh, Sir John, honoured guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, on to the main uh, business of this evening. Uh, it gives me pleasure to introduce uh, the Principal and President of King's College London, uh, Professor Ed Byrne. Uh, and if Sir John you could join us on stage as well, that would be great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Theo. Uh, look, can I start by saying what a huge privilege it is for me to have joined King's College London at a time when it is cementing its own place as one of the world's great universities with so many things going positively for King's in recent times. Uh, a jewel in the crown for King's uh, is our wonderful Department of War Studies. Uh, and this event, the annual War Studies Lecture, is one of the main events uh, in the annual life of the college. Uh, it gives me enormous pleasure uh, in the presence of such a distinguished audience from King's itself and more widely to introduce Sir John uh, Sowers to give his inaugural lecture as a visiting professor at King's. Sir John joined the Foreign Office in 1974 and in his early years worked in Yemen, Syria and South Africa on behalf of MI6. From 1999 to 2001, he served as Foreign Affairs Advisor to the Prime Minister. In 2001, he was appointed Her Majesty's Ambassador to Egypt, returning to London in 2003 as Director General for Political Affairs at the Foreign Office. In 2007, Sir John became the UK Permanent Representative to the United Nations. Sir John served as Chief of MI6 from 2009 to 2014. He is a Governor of the Ditchley Foundation and Chairman of Macro Advisory Partners. Sir John, welcome to King's and thank you indeed for agreeing to give the 2015 War Studies Annual Lecture. Please welcome Sir John. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Byrne, for that warm welcome. Thank you for sowing a bit of confusion about my early career, which um, will, uh, I'm sure, uh, get the Russians studying well. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> thank you for being here to chair tonight's uh, proceedings. I'm also very grateful for the, uh, to the Vice Principal, Professor Evelyn Welch, and the Dean, Professor Denise Livesley, for um, inviting me to be a professor at the Department of War Studies. And also Professor Theo Farrell, for asking me to do tonight's annual lecture, and it's a great honor to be here at King's. <clears throat> and thank you all for coming this evening. In particular, um, I worked for 13 foreign secretaries during my time as uh, in public service, from David Owen to Philip Hammond. Um, I don't know if Philip Hammond's suspicious, superstitious about being number 13, but uh, uh, anyway, the first one I worked with closely was Douglas Hurd. And that was during those momentous times after the end of the Cold War when Yugoslavia was collapsing and uh, there, were, there were problems aplenty for us to deal with. And I learned a huge amount from Douglas at that time. So it's a special honor for me that Lord Hurd is with us tonight. Thank you. Now, I suspect some of you are here tonight to see if you can find out a bit about what the chief of MI6 does each day. Well, let me tell you. You arrive in the early morning via the Thames. You have a chauffeur-driven mini submarine. It takes you to a high-tech docking area underwater. An executive rocket lift shoots you up to your office, your plush office, and there are special editions of all the newspapers waiting for you. You scan them quickly, very quickly. They're in invisible ink. And years ago, there's a special desk there. Uh, years ago, a special desk designed by Q, and you pressed a button, and a specially chilled dry martini popped up. <laughs> I thought, this is a pretty old-fashioned place. It needs to be modernized. So I had it replaced with one which made green tea instead. Anyway, you dip your pen in the green ink, and you start on the overnight top-secret files, and life begins to get serious. There are terrorists swarming over the Middle East. You've got Syria collapsing. You've got British citizens taken hostage. Ukraine is besieged. 
North Korea are testing a new generation of missiles. The Iran talks look shaky, and our top companies are subject to cyber attacks. And that's the start of most days. But let me start in the year of the Cuban Missile Crisis, 1962. I turned seven that year. <clears throat> Who here, with the exception of Laurie, uh, knows how many nuclear bombs were live tested that year in 1962? Have you got a guess? 25. 25. Any advance on 25? It was 178. It's almost one nuclear explosion every other day. And 117 of those bombs blew up in the atmosphere, on land, at sea, and high altitude. It's hard now to believe the focus on those days <coughs> with nuclear weapons. <coughs> I broke my arm around that time, and the doctor told me children had weak bones because of radioactivity in our milk and food. And radiation got into the cinema. Dr. Strangelove came out in 1964. Don't know if you remember it. US President Peter Sellers phones the Soviet leader. I've got bad news, and I've got really bad news. And the bad news is a ghastly mistake has been made. <clears throat> An American bomber is on its way to the Soviet Union, and it's going to drop a nuclear weapon. The really bad news is it can't be recalled. And uh, in the satire, a brawl breaks out between the Russian ambassador and the bellicose American general. And Peter Sellers declares, gentlemen, you can't fight here. This is the war room. <coughs> it's a, it is a triumph of cinema. And it shows some subtle wisdom as well. It shows the US and Soviet leaders locked in an ideological battle, but sharing human understandings about security and survival. In the movie, that's not enough. The events spiral out of control, and the film ends with nuclear obliteration. Of course, the Cold War didn't end that way. We stuck to dialogue. We built on what we had in common. And meticulous diplomacy produced a series of historic treaties, non-proliferation, nuclear arms reductions, the Helsinki Accords, plus, in the end, some unexpected warmth between the leaders in Washington and Moscow. That threat of nuclear confrontation, including by miscalculation or events running out of control, is still with us. We keep that in mind as we deal with Vladimir Putin's Russia and as we watch North Korea. But today, other threats feel more immediate. Terrorism, cyber attacks, failed states. One of the privileges of being a British diplomat abroad is meeting wise people from other countries. And some of my wisest counterparts have been from China. One Chinese leader was recently asked in private, what was his biggest concern? as China grew stronger. And I wouldn't have expected his reply. 400 million people, he said, were on the move, from the China's countryside to the cities. We're confident we'll, we'll provide jobs, and we'll build houses and schools and the transport. His biggest concern wasn't those sprawling practical matters. It was something else. He said, would these hundreds of millions of people hold on to their basic values? Values. It was values that were central to his concept of China. And without values, there could be no sustainable order. And my theme this evening is about values and order. And occasionally you'll have to give, forgive me the odd monumental generalization. But after the disaster of the two world wars, <clears throat> international security arrangements were set up based on shared global understandings about order. We differed with the Soviet Union on values, but we found enough common ground to coexist. Our new century is looking rather different. Long-standing ideas of order and values are being challenged in many different ways. And building new understandings for order and values is the central task of our time for political leaders and diplomats. And yes, intelligence agencies too. The relationship between the US and China will largely define the way this century plays out. The greatest power in the world, since we lost that title, has been the United States, our closest ally and a country that shares our values. China has risen rapidly to be the second greatest power. 
And both the US and China believe they're exceptional countries, that they should be exceptions to rules that apply to others. And they're both, China especially, sensitive to anything they construe as interference. They've been economic competitors, but so far, each has been able to uh, benefit from the economic engagement, whether it's investment or trade or market access. But they have quite different instincts and traditions when it comes to order and values. If they can find shared understandings on order and values, they'll, state, they'll set a striking lead for the rest of the planet. <clears throat> Over the past 50 years, we've had no major miscalculations between Washington and Beijing. And there is no diplomatic task more important than keeping it that way. Now, Henry Kissinger has done more than anyone to define and lead US and wider Western relations with China. Another privilege of recent years, for me, has been to get to know Dr. Kissinger. And there's no one I've learned more from, if I'm honest. His latest book, World Order, came out last year. And it's packed with the most amazing insights on the great themes of modern history, the state, the Westphalian system, globalization, legitimacy, the balance of power, order, and values. His emphasis on the power of evolutionary rather than revolutionary change struck a special chord for me. He said, evolutionary change strengthens order by building consensus around it. Revolutionary change destroys the old order and what freedom there was. It is usually replaced with more order and less freedom. And we'll come back to this. He also tackles some of the paradoxes and contradictions of the modern world. Vast regions of the world, he wrote, never shared in the Western concept of order. They only acquiesced in it. And these reservations are becoming explicit, for example, in Ukraine and the South China Sea. And Dr. Kissinger captures the challenges facing today's politicians and diplomats. Today's practitioners have much to learn from him in the search for common ground on values to sustain global order. <clears throat> One thing I'm concerned about is, is losing my voice. Um, my own diplomatic career has seen powerful examples of diplomacy bringing together order and values. I was first secretary in South Africa as the Cold War ended. Mrs. Thatcher was prime minister. She was no fan of sanctions. But sanctions and diplomatic pressure helped break apartheid. Thanks to the arms embargo, South African troops were being outgunned by Cubans and Angolans. And South Africa basically ran out of money. When F.W. de Klerk became president in the summer of 1989, mid-1989, foreign reserves covered just two weeks of imports. And drastic change was unavoidable. So 25 years ago this month, on the 11th of February 1990, Nelson Mandela walked free from prison. And I have a sort of personal experience of that time because I, by some chance, I happened to be the first British official to meet Nelson Mandela after his release. It was the morning after uh, his uh, famous release on the Sunday evening. And I heard a, a friend of mine phone me and said, he's giving a small press conference to a, a pool of journalists uh, in, the, in the garden of Archbishop Tutu's house. So I rushed around hoping to catch a glimpse of the great man. Um, and not only did I catch a glimpse of him, I realized that as there were only about 20 or 30 people there, I had a chance to actually say something to him. So um, I never confessed this to Douglas because he, uh, he was foreign secretary at the time, but I on the spot made up a message from the British government. <laughs> 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 and I, I approached Mr. Mandela and said, um, hello, well, you've got to start somewhere in these conversations. Um, uh, Mr. Mandela, on behalf of the British government and British people, welcome to freedom. And I, I felt very proud of myself having done that. Uh, and uh, he, he, um, uh, he immediately said, ah, Great Britain, you're a very important country to us and to what lies ahead. Please extend my warmest regards to Mrs. Thatcher and say I look forward to seeing her soon. Well. That was a pretty momentous moment. Uh, and I had the good fortune to meet Nelson Mandela half a dozen times later. But that first one minute exchange in the garden of Archbishop Tutu's house uh, stayed with me because it captured the essence of the dignity and the compassion of this great man. And it was four years later that Douglas, I accompanied Douglas to Nelson Mandela's inauguration as president. 
and the ceremony marked a triumph for negotiation itself. And Nelson Mandela epitomized, as no one else really in modern history has done, a new order based on new values. Above all, the value of generous reconciliation. South Africa stands out as a supreme moral example, unflinching moral reckoning with past crimes, but also shared forgiveness, shared optimism. It's a winning formula, and it's helped South Africans move forward largely in harmony. Compare South Africa to the fall of the Soviet Union and the communist system. Central Europe has confronted its past and overcome it. Russia has not. Presidents Gorbachev and Yeltsin did the world a huge service in ending the Cold War peacefully. And I was in meetings with senior Russians many times after 1991 as they grappled with open markets and democracy. And Russia started well. It shouldered the full debt burden of the former Soviet Union, it proclaimed political freedoms, and it introduced market reforms. And Russia became a very different place. But there, had been no, <clears throat> there has been no serious moral reckoning in Russia with the crimes of the Soviet era. No assertion of new, healthy values. And Russian politics have slipped back. Less democratic, more autocratic. Russia at first welcomed the cooperative European security arrangements. And then it got frustrated by them, and <clears throat> then it undermined them. First in Georgia, and now in a much larger way in Ukraine. And the West has responded with sanctions. Now, sanctions never work quickly to change minds in a more positive direction. Even when carefully targeted, sanctions hurt ordinary people before they hurt the leaders causing the trouble. But over time, sanctions do impose huge costs. And costs have consequences. A regime's authority declines, and its options narrow. I've seen many examples of this. South Africa, Serbia, Libya, Iran. Even in Iraq, Saddam had cut back on expensive military programs as sanctions bit. Would that we had known it in 2003. Sanctions on Russia are imposing costs, but the Ukraine crisis is no longer just about Ukraine. It's now a much bigger, more dangerous crisis between Russia and Western countries about values and order in Europe. <clears throat> Russia still has a formidable nuclear arsenal, when President Putin was first able to raise Russian military budgets, his first priority was to modernize it. He wants these ultimate weapons in his armory just for this sort of confrontation. And only three weeks ago, to demonstrate this, a bare nuclear bomber flew up the English Channel. Putin, Mr. Putin insists that Russia's own security is at stake in Ukraine, that European values and European order for Ukraine undermine Russian values and Russian order. This position flatly contradicts all the agreements Russia itself has signed and helped negotiate, supporting European order and values. But we deal with the Russia we have, not the Russia we'd like to have. We could take on Moscow, stepping up our response, provide weapons so that Ukraine can defend itself, more stringent sanctions. But how would Mr. Putin respond? As long as Mr. Putin sees the issue in terms of Russia's own security, he will be prepared to go further than we are. He would respond with further escalation on the ground, perhaps cyber attacks against us. We've had thousands of deaths in Ukraine. We could start to get tens of thousands, and then what? The test I have learned for any policy option is not so much what is the right next step. The test, much more importantly, is where will we be in two years' time if we follow this path? And policies can be strong, principled, and honorable, but they also need to be wise and reflect the realities of the balance of power. A Chinese minister was asked recently about Ukraine in private. He gave a very Chinese and very apt reply. He said, Ukraine has lost Crimea. Russia has lost Ukraine. The United States has lost Russia. We've all lost stability. Back to stability, back to order, and ultimately back to values. It's easy to pose these dilemmas. Sometimes there aren't any really good answers. Ukrainians look to us to help them have their chance 
to be able to enjoy the sort of Western freedoms and values that we enjoy here in, in the rest of Europe. We may end up with a new debilitating frozen conflict in Ukraine for years to come. That is a wretched outcome for Ukrainians, but it may be the least bad attainable outcome. For now, we can't identify shared values with Russia. Our attempt to do, it, our attempt to do so, to find order based on values, is leading to disorder. Events are moving fast, and Chancellor Merkel's efforts to restore calm certainly deserve our full support. Once we have calm, assuming we can get it, we'll need a new approach to coexistence with Mr. Putin's Russia. The convergence between Russia and the West, which we had hoped for after the Cold War, I don't think is gonna happen while Mr. Putin is in charge. We sort of know that now. But any foreseeable change of power in Russia may well be for the worse. It's not easy, and managing Russia is gonna be the defining problem in European security for years to come. Of course, Ukraine looks straightforward compared to values in the Middle East. Early on, I studied Arabic, and I met Shelley, my wife, in, uh, in, in Yemen. Um, the first time we met, I took her out to uh, dinner at the Sheraton Hotel. And after about 20 minutes, she looked at me and said, you're really a spy, aren't you, working for MI6? <laughs> it's rather, uh, just, her intuition was spot on, as it has been for the last 35 years, um, even if, uh, if it turned a few heads the way she announced it. But um, <laughs> she's been my, uh, she's been my uh, staunchest ally and fiercest critic for the last 35 years. So thank you for our journey together. Um, after we got married, we, we went to, we went to uh, Syria on our first thing. And we were pretty naive at that time. We knew that diplomats gave the occasional dinner parties. And um, uh, our first dinner party was rather memorable and left us with a deep lesson. We invited about 16 Syrians round for, round for dinner. And we'd done it fairly carefully. We had all sorts of salads and foods all lined up. Um, and we had one dish that was gonna cook in the oven, which I remember still to this day was Hawaiian chicken. Why we gave Syrians Hawaiian chicken, I have no idea. <laughs> but um, uh, so we carefully put it in, lit the oven, went away, and after about an hour of drinking whiskey and gin and tonic and everything else with our guests, we came back into the kitchen and found the gas had run out, the oven was stone cold, and the chicken was raw. So we panicked a little bit, and we had a Syrian friend who helped us, and she said, have you got a pressure cooker? So we dug out the pressure cooker, which in those days we had, a sort of standard fitment of 1980s kitchens, and we put the Hawaiian chicken in the pressure cooker, and I went back and poured more whiskey and more gin and tonic for another sort of 40 minutes or so, and I finally went back into the kitchen and said, this must be ready by now, and of course the, it was cooked, but there was the pressure cooker cooling down. I said, it must be ready by now. Anyway, I took the, the weight off the top of the pressure cooker, and a stream of Hawaiian chicken <laughs> spurted out and hit the ceiling. And I said, what the hell are we going to do now? And Shelley said, just calm down, opened it up, poured it into a dish, scraped it off the seat, and put it in, <laughs> took it into our now whiskey-soaked guests and provided them at long last with their supper they've been waiting for the last two hours for. But it taught me a monumental uh, political lesson, that if you take the lid off a pressure cooker when it's, not, when it's too early, you get a frightful mess. And um, that brings me on to Egypt. <laughs> I was um, ambassador in Cairo in the two years after 9-11. We encouraged President Mubarak's reforms, limited as they were. And economic reform boosted investment and growth, but in the absence of accountability, it also boosted corruption. Mubarak's security-obsessed regime just couldn't get its head around political reform. You might say that Western leaders indulged Mubarak for too long, but abandoning him overnight generated distrust across the Arab world. And Henry Kissinger in World Order makes a wise point. In international affairs, he wrote, a reputation for reliability is a more important asset than showing tactical cleverness. The world was impressed by the Tahrir Square demonstrations. Was this the opening to the sort of Middle Eastern style pluralism that we've been working for, for looking for for decades? No, Tahrir Square wasn't Egypt. Egyptians knew two sources of power, the regime backed by the army and the Ikhwan, the Muslim brothers. And after the army removed Mubarak, these two forces first tried to collude, and when that failed, 
they collided. The army were never going to be seen off by the Ikhwan, and the Muslim brothers never seriously tried to coexist. Now the military are back in power under President Sisi, who is trying to address Egypt's deep-seated problems. He knows Egypt needs to balance its books, that it can't afford these subsidies on food and fuel, and he has to remove them, however tough and unpopular that might be. President Sisi is also calling for Islam to face up to its own extremist elements, and that's important political leadership. And Egypt is finding its own path to order and values. Evolution better than revolution. I think that we in the UK should work with President Sisi and support his efforts to deliver change at a sustainable rate. Further east, there's been a massive diplomatic effort over 12 years that I've been part to, party to to try to strike a deal with Iran over its nuclear program. After the strong backing that the UK gave the US um, over Iraq, Jack Straw, then Foreign Secretary, felt able to act without US participation over Iran. And I was back in London then, as, uh, as Professor Byrne says, and I joined French and German colleagues as the leaders of the original E3 negotiating team. And our Iranian counterparts were none other than Javad Zarif, then, US, then Iranian ambassador at the UN, and Hassan Rouhani, then the Secretary of the National Security Council, the same team we have today. We had meeting after meeting in different cities, culminating in three days of exhausting negotiations in Paris in November 2004. The French Foreign Ministry started with a grand, din grand lunch on the Friday, but by Sunday afternoon their hospitality had run dry, and we were literally living on tap water and crisps. And it may be that that diet helped, because we hammered out an agreement in those uh, rather hungry hours. Iran was suspend all nuclear enrichment activity within a wider process to find a new relationship between Iran and Europe. Sadly, in diplomacy, the effort that goes into reaching a deal isn't commensurate with, the, with that deal sticking. The deal was implemented, but this one didn't stick. Washington were reluctant to ease the trade restrictions needed to hold Iran to the bargain, and sentiment in Iran turned against it. And timing makes such a difference in diplomacy. Just as the Bush administration at the start of its second term was beginning to think new thoughts about Iran and the E3 initiative, uh, were beginning to think about what flexibility they could show, the Iranians elected President Ahmadinejad, who scuppered the agreement before any of that new flexibility could be deployed. But this time there was an impressive global response to that, to the threat that Iran posed to global values and global order. The UN Security Council, with Russia and China in active support, imposed sanctions on Iran. And the US and the European Union added their own, uh, their own financial measures. <coughs> Iran denies that sanctions have had a political effect. Well, every country subject to sanctions uh, takes that line. But slowly, painfully, sanctions have changed attitudes in Iran. And now the Obama administration is pushing hard from the front. Agreement with Iran is possible, in my view, and highly desirable. But the politics need to work, both in Tehran and in Washington, and there needs to be confidence that Iran is really not going to develop nuclear weapons. I hope we get agreement. And in my view, a partial agreement is better than no agreement. And I certainly hope it lasts longer than the one I helped to broker over 10 years ago. I think the Iran example shows how, under the right conditions, a global consensus can form around threats to order and values. In the 1990s, we had a good run with Russia and China in responding to dangerous problems in the Middle East, in the former Yugoslavia, and parts of Africa. It was Iraq that changed it. I was in Cairo in the run-up to the Iraq conflict, so it wasn't part of the internal British policy debate. But I did see the case for intervention in Iraq, and I later supported our wider role in Afghanistan. I thought we would open the way to a more modern and tolerant order in those countries and better values. There has been real progress in Afghanistan, though the cost in lives was higher than we had ever imagined. And Iraq? Well, the communities suppressed by Saddam, the Shia and Kurds, fare much better. But the country has fallen prey to sectarianism. It lacks the order needed for any modern state. And what progress has been made 
has been set back by the chaos next door in Syria. In the wake of Iraq and Afghanistan, Britain is pulling back from international intervention, just as America pulled back after the Vietnam War. And when crisis erupted in Libya, ministers didn't feel it right to sit by as Gaddafi crushed decent Libyans demanding an end to dictatorship. But nor did they want to get embroiled in Libya's problems by sending in ground forces. And I understood all these, all these pressures. After Gaddafi was ousted, there was no one to hold the ring to help manage a transition to something better, as the, the US and Britain and other allies had done in Baghdad and Kabul. Libya had no institutions. Who or what would take over? The answer, those were the weapons. The result, growing chaos, exploited by fanatics. Syria, different situation, same outcome. I was cautious in our UK discussions about intervening in Syria, bearing in mind the lessons of Iraq. But I supported the case for responding hard when Assad used chemical weapons against his own people. A red line had been crossed, but there was no public or parliamentary appetite to use force in response. Parliament voted it down. Yes, intervening has huge risks and huge costs. Not intervening also has huge risks and huge costs. Which outcome is worse, Afghanistan and Iraq or Syria and Libya? Maybe it's too early to say, but we do need to have that debate in this country. In all these countries I've talked about, Russia, Egypt, Iran, Syria, Iraq, these threaten wider, our wider security and they present our political leaders with wide-reaching policy dilemmas. But at least there are, are identifiable national leaders that we can work with, however tough or unpleasant they might be. We can imagine hard discussions and compromises about values and order. And the essence of diplomacy is dealing with people we disagree with. Diplomacy gets into quite new orders of difficulty when states lose control over their own territory. Take Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State phenomenon. What possible negotiation can you have with terrorists like those? Back in, MI back in uh, 2010, I gave the first public speech by a chief of MI6. I said, you and millions of people like you go about your business in our cities and towns free of fear. Why? Because the British government works tirelessly out of the public eye to stop terrorists and would-be terrorists in their tracks. For a while, we in MI6 and MI5 and GCHQ felt on top of the problem. But since 2013, the terrorist threat has risen again. Thousands of European citizens have gone to Syria to fight against Assad. Some of them are returning to fight against us and are emboldening others in their communities. The recent attacks in France and now Denmark were shocking, but they were not unexpected, given the much higher threat we now face. We've joined an international coalition to hit back against Islamic State, and here and there its advance is being slowed, even reversed. But as battles rage and atrocities are committed, the regime and Islamist terrorists find common cause in attacking moderate Syrian forces. This is part of a wider battle. Christians in the Middle East, Jews in Europe, are being killed simply because of their faith. And it's being done in the name of Islam. A ferocious clash between different branches and interpretations of Islam is taking place. Violent Islamist fundamentalism rejects our every value. It rejects the world's most basic unit of order, the modern state. It uses our technology. We see postmodern social networking being used to boast about pre-modern savagery. And this phenomenon of Islamist extremism across the Middle East, in Nigeria and elsewhere, is a disaster above all for Muslims. Muslims are the biggest victim of Islamist terrorism. Now, it isn't for us to solve this problem within the Islamic tradition. That's a task for the Islamic world itself. We look to Islamic countries to stop these fanatics, denounce their ideologies, and offer a better path for their youth. But don't expect any quick fixes. Decisions and doctrines that Islam adopted centuries ago fall to be re-examined. 
and Muslims need to find a modern Islamic framework for values and order compatible with the values and order and freedoms of non-Muslims across the planet. We in the, best, we in the West can best help what will be a long and arduous process by quietly supporting those in the Muslim world who step forward to lead it. Meanwhile, we do what we can to keep the terrorist threat at bay. It can't be defeated in the usual sense of the word. So how do we keep terrorism at bay? My final point is on security and technology. Now who in this room didn't lock their front door when they left earlier today? No one. Who did lock their door? And most of you, I hope. But when we lock our doors, we make various assumptions. We make assumptions about burglars, about the local police, about the honesty of our fellow citizens, uh, about the small print of our home insurance policies, and about our right to privacy. What if those assumptions are wrong? What if a criminal can just appear outside your front door from anywhere in the world and try thousands of keys in your lock every second? Well, welcome to the world of cybercrime and cyberterrorism. And thanks in large part to Mr. Snowden, our intelligence picture to cover these challenges is weaker than it was. All of us, you and me here tonight, are more at risk from terrorism and cyber attack. And why? Mainly because technology companies have scaled back their previous quiet cooperation with intelligence agencies. We all want and we all rely on the amazing benefits of highly networked technologies. We want maximum freedom, we want maximum privacy, we also want maximum protection from terrorism and cyber crime. Our security agencies take privacy really seriously. <coughs> the rules governing use of data are strict and they're tightly monitored. And when staff breach those rules, the consequences are immediate. People have been sacked and walked out of the building. I respect privacy advocates. I want privacy as much as you, maybe even more than you. But I do feel that privacy advocates sometimes take security for granted. I applaud the technology companies for what they've achieved. They do amazing things. And they've all sorts of laws and regulations and reputations that they have to balance. But national security, your and my security as we gather here tonight, the security that allows every person in the UK to rest, evening this e rest easy this evening, that security does not come out of thin air or good intentions. It takes diligence and hard effort from us all. It can't just be left to the intelligence agencies. Now, I've urged this before and I do so again tonight. Technology companies and governments and we the public have to work together to counter those who menace us and our way of life. None of us can afford for terrorists to use Facebook and other social media to plot their next attack, confident that no one can monitor them. We have to develop a new order for our new technological era, and maybe some new values too. Now this is not easy. In fact, it's very hard. It's hard procedurally, it's hard conceptually, but we will pay a much bigger price if we fail. As a principal, I spent 36 years in public service, and a career in public service remains unsurpassed in terms of job satisfaction. You're contributing to wider public goods, in my case, peace and security. You're doing it every week, every month, and every year. And I commend it to those who are students here at King's College. I began and ended my public service in MI6. It wasn't quite as extensive as Professor Byrne suggested at the beginning. But uh, I did learn, especially in my last five years, how good intelligence underpins our freedoms. It helps our leaders understand the intentions and instincts of people who want to hurt us. During the Cold War, intelligence helped avoid Dr. Strangelove's Armageddon when all those nuclear tests were happening. And both sides understood what it was at stake and made wise calculations. Intelligence is even more crucial now. Penetrating terrorist movements, tracking cyber activists, understanding hostile foreign powers, I've spent many a fretful weekend in the last five years concerned for our officers and our secret agents deployed on high-risk operations. And I say to you tonight, 
the men and women of MI6 and MI5 and GCHQ have extraordinary commitment and loyalty to this nation and to our nation's values. And the secret agents who work for MI6 are mainly not British. They're foreign nationals operating in their own countries, directly risking their lives. They work for us for different reasons, but for many of them, one reason comes first. They believe in the British approach to values and order. And their courage sets us a towering example. And the greatest honour of my career has been to lead MI6. My simple point tonight is this. In our lifetime, the limits of security have changed dramatically. From mutually assured destruction by nuclear weapons to risks of social breakdown through terrorism or cyber attacks. And ideas of order and values are shifting too. The way we think about security needs to change accordingly. I believe it will change. Our public servants and political leaders have momentous responsibilities for making wise judgments at moments of intense crisis. In my darker moments, I wonder what happens if, Eurasia, if Russia destabilizes a NATO ally, if Islamic State advances on all fronts, if those coordinated terrorist attacks blasting Western cities, and whilst all this happens, the Eurozone crashes and a major Western bank <coughs> is brought down by a cyber attack. There'll be quite a pile of top secret files the following morning in, uh, in front of my successor. But after those 36 years and my five final years as chief of MI6, I've passed those files on to someone else. Don't get me wrong, I do so with full confidence, but also with a certain private relief. Now, there are many friends and family here tonight, but one person is not. My father died six years ago. He was 16 when World War II broke out. In 1942, he trained as a navigator flying swordfish and Avenger bombers from aircraft carriers. He crossed the Atlantic from New York in a convoy which were attacked by German U-boats. And of the 90, 90 vessels that set sail from New York, fewer than 70 reached Britain. My father almost froze to death in the North Atlantic when his own plane came down. He flew low-level raids against well-defended Japanese positions in Indonesia. And he saw fellow ships attacked by kamikaze planes and was wondering if one was coming his way. He was only 22 when war ended, and he turned up here at King's College in September 1947. Still, I think, traumatized by his wartime experiences. He graduated two years later, and he had his life back. And he fathered uh, five children after his marriage, and one of them was me. So thank you, King's College, <laughs> from all my family for rebuilding his life. And you've given so many young men and women like him a fantastic start. I think after what he went through, my father would have smiled wryly when Laurie Friedman and Theo Farrell asked me to be a visiting professor of war studies here at King's. But I've accepted the offer. Be warned, I'll be back. Thank you very much. On behalf of the King's community, Sir John, uh, thank you so much for your own immense contributions to our nation and to international peace, uh, and also for an absolutely brilliant inaugural lecture. You've set a very high standard. Uh, Sir John has kindly agreed to take, I'm afraid we can only make it a small number of questions, uh, but if you could um, identify yourself, say who you are, we'll get the ball rolling. Who would like to start? Yes. And then to your left. Yep, I can hear you. Good. Um, my name's Andrew Lamb, I'm uh, Leslie today. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, toward the end of your talk, you were talking about public involvement in, uh, very public involvement in security. Mm. Recently, in the last couple of weeks, the hacker group Anonymous has um, you know, been launching attacks against ISIS and taking down their social media uh, sites. This group has also attacked security services mm. in the past. How do you feel about the fact that both your organization and ISIS have been the subject of anonymous, anonymous focus? <laughs> 
Well, uh, this is all part of a, uh, a confusing modern world picture that we're living in. And of course, anybody who joins the, uh, uh, the fight against ISIS, uh, their activities are welcome, most of them anyway, and those who try to bring down um, the organizations that are protecting security and order in our own countries is unwelcome. Now, um, I think hacktivists and others have uh, a feel of their own power and they're using it in different directions. I think we need to have a clearer sense of, uh, collectively, of how um, uh, the whole area of cyber should be regulated and monitored. Um, and uh, I think this is an undeveloped world, actually, uh, both internationally between states and in terms of the regulation within states. I think uh, there's a big task here for politicians and for perhaps the next parliament to get to grips with these sorts of issues. Now, I don't have any particular views. I don't know the details of the, of the attacks that you're referring to in terms of what they've done against Islamic State. Um, but I think uh, uh, those organizations are sufficiently uh, uh, agile that they will be able to respond quite quickly. Um, so I don't think uh, I herald this as a great step forward, but I do think the whole area of cyber is one which is pretty anarchic at the moment, and you've just described an example of that, and we need to bring a degree of order to it. Yes, just, just here, uh, uh, two along, and then uh, three rows back. Hi, my name's Victoria. I'm a War Studies um, alumni and also Treasury employee. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, what you'll be doing as a visiting professor. professor. Will you be researching, lecturing, or anything, or, or just giving us wonderful talks? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> the answer is, I don't yet know. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to be um, quite as devoted, perhaps, as David Omand, who is a, a regular uh, lecturer here, but I do want to be associated with the work of King's for all the reasons that I've set out. I think there's a, um, someone like myself making the transition from public service uh, into the uh, commercial world. I think it's really important to stay in touch with the, with the world of ideas and with a generation uh, 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 which is represented here at King's. So I'm really looking forward to taking part in your debates, in your discussions, and if I can be of help in, in the work of students here, understanding some of the events of the last 30 odd years that I've been involved with, I'd be delighted to do so. Yes. Um, thank you very much for, for your talk. I'm an MA student here at the Wall Studies Department. Um, you spoke a lot about values uh, tonight, and I think that was very spot on. And I was wondering what we actually need to do in Europe to strengthen our values as a union of nations to better deal with threats such as Russia, mm -hmm. um, but also um, with a lot of other issues we're facing globally um, to strengthen the union itself to be a greater power on the world scale. The European Union, you mean? Yes. Yeah. Well, I think Europe has done a remarkable job in developing its values uh, since, uh, since the end of the Second World War, and it's built some fantastic institutions to do so. I don't think in Western Europe there's a values gap. What there might be is a gap in the capacity to defend those values when they come under attack. And of course, it's entirely understandable after the end of the Cold War that defense capabilities uh, were, were drawn back and drawn down and defense budgets across Europe. Um, we, now, we used to have a standard of 3% of GDP spent on defense. We now have 2% of GDP spent on defense. Um, and we need to invest in these defense capabilities. We need to invest in the intelligence capabilities as well. As I hope I've set out, uh, we are under threat. Um, and our values are under threat. So uh, strong institutions like NATO and the European Union are a vital part of that. Uh, building partnerships with others, having a deeper dialogue with people like President Putin, which I think has been absent, frankly, over the last couple of years. The quality of that dialogue hasn't helped that there's not been the depth of exchange between Washington and Moscow that there was, for example, quite routinely during the Cold War. Um, so uh, we need to, uh, I don't think it's our values that we need to look to so much, except possibly in the technological space, where, where I think we need to explore what the right values are in the new technology era. But we need to be more on our mettle more ready to recognize challenges to our values and to our system. And we also need to uh, invest in diplomacy, not with people who agree with us, but diplomacy with the people who disagree with us, which, as I said in my speech, is the, uh, is the essence of, of, of that art. Yes. So, um, thank you very much indeed. Um, the name's uh, Ewan Grant. I'm the 
former customs and excise intelligence analyst for the ex-Soviet Union. Mm. And, uh, after I left, a um, temporary resident of the Sheraton Hotel in Sana, where I remember somebody giving away their past career by uh, <laughs> a word uh, in the restaurant. I'm glad to say that was not a British person. Um, my question to John actually follows on from yeah. the, the lady's question and, and your own answer. Um, and your point about how in the UK, and I'm sure in many other nation states, there is a very real public service ethos, and I certainly agree 100% how important that is. Where do we stand with um, the wider international organizations like the World Bank particularly, I was, it was a World Bank project I was on in Yemen, but also in um, the IMF and the various non-military mm. um, arms of the UN because I do believe your comments about need to be on our metal. I, I don't think these organizations are entirely comfortable with playing a part as, shall we say, concerned international citizens. Okay. Well, let, 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 let me take that question. I, and <clears throat> I, I, I think the IMF and the World Bank are two remarkable institutions. Now, of course, they've had to adapt like everybody else has had to adapt over the last years. And you know, like many of these international bodies that were established in 1945, their governance structures don't represent the reality of the modern world. But you know, we've got to work on. We've got to work on that. But I think the you know, the announcement um, uh, last week of the uh, IMF program for Ukraine, I think, was a very clear example of how the IMF are very much plugged into the political and security needs and see the role for economic and financial support alongside <coughs> um, defense actions. Now, uh, the, the World Bank operates mainly in, in the developing world rather than in the areas that we've been discussing uh, this evening. But I think they're a remarkable force for good. Now, every organization has to modernize itself to keep up with technology. Uh, keep up with the modern challenges. We saw during the Ebola virus uh, scandal last year, the uh, crisis last year, um, the World Health Organization really struggling to understand what it can do and its governance structure is just unable to respond to it. So everybody needs to up their game, uh, make these organizations agile and flexible and responsive. Uh, that was mainly my role when I was chief of MI6, was to modernize the organization. Um, and I think uh, all these institutions with very strong cultures, very strong histories and traditions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they need uh, a blend of leadership, the expertise inside the organization, uh, coupled with outside people who can say with a pair of fresh eyes, why on earth are we doing it this way? Or why are we, you know, why has this not changed since 1970? And I think every organization needs that dose of modernization. Maybe um, King's College does as well. <laughs> That's my job. <laughs> We're coming to the end of our time, so we'll take a question in the middle, uh, and then gentlemen here, and look, maybe I'll take a third, but we'll have to stop the questions then. Okay. So uh, if you try to make the question short, that would be appreciated. Sukhan Khabadze, I'm an intelligence and intelligence security student here. Um, thank you for your fascinating talk and insight and speech. So, um, I would like to ask you your view about the hybrid warfare Russian, uh, Russian action in Ukraine, and what is the best way to deter against this warfare, especially we Georgians think that uh, we could be easy target next on the Russian list. So is there any uh, effective tool to, to, to well, apply? Well, I, I think one lesson from the Ukraine crisis is that the Russians have developed a capability that NATO at the moment doesn't have a, have a, 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 a strong response to that uh, the appearance of these little green men in Crimea uh, of uh, uh, rapidly deployed special, force, special troops into uh, Don, in the Donbass region, I think it, it demonstrates the, um, uh, uh, the way that Russia has focused its efforts on the military side, a very large proportion, and I, I don't have a figure in my head, but a very large proportion of Russian public spending goes on defense, much higher than it does in any Western country. Um, and they're investing it in new technologies, asymmetric 
responses used to be about chemical and biological weapons or nuclear weapons. Asymmetric responses is now the sort of insurgency that we've seen in Crimea and the Donbass. And NATO needs to rethink its approach so that if that happened in Estonia or Latvia uh, or indeed uh, anywhere else in Central Europe, we're, we're ready for it and we have a response which isn't a traditional response of um, planes and tanks and backed by nuclear weapons. Uh, we need to ourselves address these new security challenges. I don't think there's an, e an early answer to that. I think there's a big job for academic uh, institutions like King's to think about these problems. It can't all be done in the North Atlantic Council in Brussels. Uh, there needs to be some stimulus in the academic community as well because we don't have immediate answers to it. Nick Butler, King's. Um, John, from your experience, do you think that there are a distinct set of Muslim values? And do you feel that those values are compatible with the British values that you talked about? Or will there always be a tension uh, as with Russia? I, I, I think there are some very clear values in Islam um, uh, of piety, of honesty, um, of uh, uh, one of the reasons why the Muslim Brotherhood gained attention, uh, gained support in a place like Egypt, was because uh, it was a contrast uh, to the regime. But that's, the Muslim Brotherhood doesn't equate to Islam. I think Islam does have strong traditions and strong values which aren't vastly different from the values of the other monotheistic uh, religions. I think the tensions are more political than they are theological. And the real divide in the Islamic world is, uh, is a political one, which is uh, where people are adopting interpretations of Islam. But I do think that the, uh, the way in which um, Islam was sort of perfectly formed uh, uh, 1,400 years ago, um, and uh, uh, of course many of the decisions were taken in subsequent centuries, but its internal flexibility has not helped it adapt to the modern world. And that's what I say when I think the Islamic world has some really tough issues it needs to address. Now, is there an intrinsic um, a tension between the Islamic world and Western values. I think there are differences. I think there are differences, for example, we have um, between the Western world and China and Chinese traditions. I don't think these are unbridgeable. I think there's plenty of common ground. What we can't have is one set of vanilla values that applies throughout the world. So there's bound to be some variations. And um, I'm struck that uh, uh, you know, as Western countries, sorry, as developing countries um, in, uh, develop, <clears throat> initially Westernization helps them modernize. But there's a curve after which it reverses. And as they get wealthier and more developed, there's an assertion of traditional values. We see that in Turkey, we're seeing it in China. Um, and I think the West, when I started my career, the G8, no, G7, countries represented about 75% of global GDP. We we're completely dominant. Now it's less than 50%. In another generation, it will be considerably less than that. The world is becoming flatter, as Tom Friedman said, and it, we are going to have to find ways to accommodate each other's differences. But it's going to have to be, if we're going to have the same degree of order we've had over the last 60 years, it's going to have to be uh, a set of accommodations and values that support global order rather than undermine it. And you're right to identify there are some deep issues here, and there aren't easy answers, but I don't, I don't despair. I don't think there's a fundamental schism in here. I think it's a question, really, of modernizing our thinking and ourselves on the Western side becoming uh, more open and more tolerant. And I've, I've said before that um, there's absolutely no justification for what happened at Charlie Hebdo or in the attack over the weekend at Denmark, in Denmark. But I do think we need to be careful not to unnecessarily offend other people's sensibilities just for taking pleasure in offending them. I think the Pope was right when he said we need to be cautious and respectful of other people's fundamental beliefs. If we're disrespectful, we only really fuel the extremists. Hi, Emily Goldstein from The Telegraph. Um, you mentioned the recent attacks in France and in Denmark. Uh, do you think the security services in the UK are any more able to prevent such attacks as these taking place than our counterparts in Europe have been? And therefore, do you think the UK may see a Charlie Hebdo-style attack? Thank you. Do I think? 
the UK may see, uh, may find itself facing a Charlie Hebdo style <coughs> attack? Well, I think it was a year ago that the uh, threat level here in the UK was raised um, uh, to severe, and the definition of severe means that a terrorist attack is highly likely. Um, I've said before that when you see all these uh, attempts at carrying out terrorist attacks in this country, you know, the goalkeepers in the security service and the police aren't going to be able to stop every single one of them getting through. Uh, the terrorists at some point will probably score one of those goals. Um, I, I do think in Britain uh, we are well organized. There's very good cooperation between law enforcement and intelligence and between different parts of the intelligence community. We learned that uh, after the costly events of uh, July 2005. Um, uh, but are we immune? No. Far from it. Um, as I said, these, shock, these attacks are shocking, but they're not surprising because they're part of a pattern of uh, increased terrorist threats that, uh, uh, that we need to be very mindful of in this country. And okay, you can see um, that uh, uh, there may be particular reasons why terrorists struck in uh, the targets that they did, um, but this indiscriminate killing of Jewish targets, for example, just like the indiscriminate killing of Christians across the Middle East, is all part of trying to sow divisions and, and uh, um, uh, generate support uh, for the extremist cause. And uh, uh, I think we are well organized here. Um, but as I say, <clears throat> the terrorist uh, uh, centers of terrorism are closer to Europe. We've got thousands of people going back and forth from Western Europe to places like Syria. And the intelligence picture is weaker. So of course the threat is higher. Well, it's always good to end an inaugural lecture with a forest of hands of people wishing to ask questions. I'm sorry we can't take them all, uh, but Sir John may be willing to speak to you informally in the function afterwards if you're able to attend. Uh, on behalf of the audience and the King's community, uh, sincere thanks to John for providing your insights into your working life uh, in many aspects of international di diplomacy, including a time as sea. Uh, and for your reflections on the security challenges ahead. Uh, most of all, to me, I think you spoke about values, uh, the values you've seen and those which have guided the world through difficult times of the past, uh, the values we must stand behind and perhaps develop further uh, to take the world in the way we need it to go, and shining through your whole uh, dissertation, uh, your own strong values uh, and beliefs. Um, You've had a splendid career, uh, and it's wonderful that you're joining us uh, at King's uh, as a visiting professor. Thanks very much. So thank you again. Thank you.